Hey there. Probably, I wanted to ask you, since I'm saying shit, I felt like this would be a perfect opportunity to use the bleep. Oh, to bleep out Exactly. Your name. That's why I kept do, doing that. I'll definitely do that, dude. There's no chance that I'll forget. <laughs> All right. And that I'll also <laughs> include this bit where you also <laughs> identify your middle name as <laughs> Okay, cool. And I won't forget to delete out of this also. Right. Just saying, my middle name, you know, a cannot go in the end. Oh, I, dude, there will be no in this episode. Seriously, you have to bleep that out with a bleep. Right. And my brother's name is too, so I don't want him to be identified either. So exactly. all will be bleeped out. That's good. I'm not even going to use this bit, but if I do, we have to bleep. will be bleeped out. Exactly. Everybody. This is the New Low News Show. I'm King Kobe. Uh, MC Graham. And uh, I don't know if you've heard, but recent documents reveal that they were going to use live ammunition on Occupy Houston protesters in 2011. Um, Kobe, I'm a little, if you'll bear with me, I'm a little bit confused. Uh, because from what I understand, uh, and from what I've read, and I've looked into this quite a bit, the Occupy movement mm-hmm. is like the most harmless people <laughs> in the world. Why would you ever, you know? What? I mean, uh, I've been to Occupy Baltimore. Yeah. Yeah, there's free coffee. Yeah. Some, uh, I think there were some pastries of some kind. I think I talked to some guy about like being broke. Yeah. Yeah, and then I went home. It's pretty <laughs> nice. Pretty good time. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, there was never going to be a crackdown in Baltimore uh, simply because the city doesn't have any money <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> it couldn't pay the overtime for right. the cops necessary but to there was a people. coordinated crackdown in many major cities yeah. coordinated by the department of homeland security this is in november 2011 yeah. after it launched in september 2011 so it had grown and spread to many cities mm-hmm. thousands of participants in some cities but why do you think they were so concerned. I mean, if people just want to meet together in a park and drink coffee and talk about how much they hate the man or how much corporate capitalism is ruining this country, uh, things that are obviously true, why does it require a coordinated crackdown, a subversion, live ammunition, uh, agent provocateurs, or whatever they call them? Well, even though Occupy was in most instances expressively nonviolent, yeah. uh, anti capitalism is what'll get the jackboots out. Yeah. And that's really what freaks out the elite. So right. to speak, to borrow a phrase from the Tea Partiers, or well, that's that's what freaks people out, or what what freaks the government out. Right. Well, that could actually explain why there was no crackdown on the Tea Party, because those guys would show up to rallies with fucking firearms. You know right. what I mean? And talk about ending the Fed and impeaching Obama and preventing socialism, the one world government, the right. fluoridation of water, you know, <laughs> all that stuff. They could do all this stuff, but they never talked about the basic corporate structure. They never attacked that. As a matter of fact, they seem to be huge fans of it. Right. So you can, yeah, so you can show up to protest weapons, talk all kinds of shit, but as long as you more or less are in favor of the sort of oligarchs uh, they're not going to fuck with you. Yes. As, as a matter of fact, they'll use you. <laughs> <laughs> they will fund you. Yes. Yeah. Whereas the Occupy Groups was a legitimate grassroots movement. Right. And as such, a lot of the people participating found an outlet, including me. I participated briefly. Yeah. Found an outlet for uh, modes of thinking beyond capitalism or questioning capitalism yeah. uh, where you really can't find it anywhere else and well what's the problem with capitalism don't you believe in an honest day's work Cody? <laughs> <laughs> don't you believe in paying your fair share to put it briefly <laughs> no <laughs> i really don't right uh, i think things can be organized in a much more just manner there's there's so much ridiculous shit you <laughs> see in a, in a in this kind of sort of consumerist corporatist capitalism feudalism we live in right where you have more uh, peopleless homes than homeless people, right? Uh, with no plan to just put them there. <laughs> just sort of like materialist problems right. that could be solved if we just didn't think in terms of well, you got to get out there and pull yourself up by your bootstraps and 
just be a fucking self-made millionaire. Well, I, yeah, I do believe in self-reliance, but uh, the problem is pull yourself up by your bootstraps means go work for fucking $7 an hour with no benefits. Right. That's not pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. That's being a fucking surf. But I have these moments, like, one of the big criticism. I my favorite criticism of capitalism is actually comes back from the earliest sort of radical uh, sort of uh, texts and movements against industrialization. They noticed that when people moved from the countryside to the city, that they would just get fucked up, get you know? Get sick, get yeah, broken. Yeah, just, just yeah, fuck up the human body. And you still see it today. Like, I don't go out into the public very often because... I'm suspicious of people and their motivations. Oh, it's very bright and cold yeah, out there at the and, moment. You know, like, I just, I can't be bothered most days. But I went to the bank the other day, and I was standing in line, and I was looking around, and uh, I saw, it was like every person except for maybe one was fucked up in some way. Like, I'm, I have bad health. You know, I look okay, but I, I'm right, all weak. They were all slouching or yeah, have a limp or, or overweight. Out. Yeah, or like, just obviously degenerated in some way and this is the most affluent and powerful and oh if you're to believe the industrial capitalists we have right. arrived this yes. is this is it <laughs> this is the fucking promised land here you go now limp around for the rest of your life you sick bastard and pay us you know pay us for the privilege to do so right um, so fuck that. Right. Bottom line, capitalism is stupid. And you know what? But if you say that, you will, you'll <laughs> instantly be able... Okay, you can say it. But if you go out in public and say it, then right. you will instantly if you try, be on, If you try to gather anti-capitalists right. in any capacity... You will be on some sort of radar. Um, and so even harmless grad students who study critical theory or something like that and look very, uh, you know, just mellow right. and tolerant and compassionate holding the most milk toast anti finance signs in a public place will get the attention of local and federal law enforcement yeah well there was a real worry i think among um the powers that be that these things would just keep growing with unemployment so high still yeah. i think it was described as a church of dissent so i think they really did feel the need to crack down on it <laughs> One interesting thing about uh, the way the, the media and pop culture in general portrayed these uh, individuals at these encampments was that they were d dirty hippies. Yeah, uh, drum-beating beatniks. Right. They were dropouts, stoners, losers, burnouts, whatever you want to call them. And um, I do think that a lot of that was just plain shit talking oh yeah it's media like, media you know spinning yarns yeah mislander right but i do think there's something there uh which might be worth talking about because when you see a guy on television or whatever getting interviewed about why he's occupying and he just looks like a you know sort of I'm trying to figure out a politically correct way to phrase this, but yeah, no, he just looks space like space case. Yeah, like an effeminate sort of space case who's you know dressed all raggedy and looks like he's just a total like like nothing's really going on upstairs. Like I think that does hurt the you, you know cause it, of uh, economic liberalism. Yeah, yeah, and it, and it kind of brings out your inner reactionary. You know, you're just like son, shut up. You know what I mean? Like and um, well, it's kind of uh, down to a more abstract question, I would say, which yeah. is that is compassion or having compassion, a strength, a virtue, how does it reflect on people? Like, you look at, for example, anarchists and uh, socialists and you know, people advocating for radical ideas like prison abolition and the abolition of the wage system in the early 1900s, and these were just like, just normal ass dudes, you know, they were wearing yeah. suits, wearing top hats, as was the style, Yeah. you know, uh, carrying handguns, because yeah. you could just buy them at hardware stores back then. And, uh, Shooting people, <laughs> <laughs> right? But they didn't. There was no uniform. It was just an economic and sort of social position, right? And, yeah, and, and there still, was some manliness to it, right? Exactly. You know, they still talked about the brotherhood of man. You know, universal uh, uh, sort of liberation, uh, uh, the next phase of human civilization, all that stuff. So they, still, they still talk about like sort of positive, compassionate ideas. That's what motivated them. A lot of them even cite a lot of the anarchists in America, even cited. Uh, Jesus 
you know, right. as an example of an early anarchist, and they said they essentially believed in his teachings, but that they were just trying to translate them into the here and now as opposed to heaven, which they didn't believe in. So they were still talking about compassion, but you're right, there was still some sort of masculinity to it. And nowadays, uh, the relationship between masculinity and liberalism or leftism is extremely fraught. Well, and you could say it sort of eroded. Right. Uh, in the hippie era, if that could be said to be an era, in the yes. 60s through the early 70s, when you know a lot of culturally significant liberal gains were made with the civil rights era, mm-hmm. but sort of the uh, rebellion of sort of mostly American white youths, and they're sort of turning to um, non-materialism, yeah. embracing concepts like free love, sort of getting into Eastern philosophy, things that really had nothing to do with the... You know, bare bones, kind of anti-war, right. um, anti-statist liberalism. Yeah, and so this continues through to this day. And it's the image, you know, and it's the image that is what hurts people, because when you think, because some hippies and other people were, like you said, very dedicated to anti-war and uh, fighting the corrosive effects of capitalism. But it's the image of being a sort of a Dionysian orgiest yeah, or whatever hedonist. yeah they're kind of like and that's what trickles down to you know the popular consciousness and that's what people hate right um and so even, i think the, even sort of the psychedelic utopianism you yeah. know i mean I'm a, I'm a big fan of psychedelics right i mean they're not gonna they're not gonna cause a revolution but this is an idea that floated around right and exists to this day because not everybody is down with drugs and free love and hedonism and right. all that so when you see modern day liberals like let's say people um, who are willing to occupy public space for the Occupy movement, you, you know, I think a lot of these concepts come to people's mind, and they don't feel so bad when the cops, you know, repress them or yeah, whatever. Yeah, going and crack skulls. Because they just think, oh, well, these freeloaders, these, you know, because they're relating them to hippies, yeah. and really, I, you know, supported them, and what I related to was, I was thinking of them more like these old-school anti-capitalists. Right, yeah, and I guess it's kind of the big question is, what is the relationship between sort of social libertinism and uh, uh, and economic right. liberation, because uh, social libertinism puts people off, especially in America, because we're all like puritanical weirdos. Whereas economic liberation is what you need to fucking survive. So I think, in my opinion, a lot of the time, the the masculine sort of economic liberation, sort of advocating for the working class, right. uh, gets lost or somehow confused or intentionally obscured. Right. With sort of, yeah, uh, the relaxing of social mores, you know, cultural mores or something like that, which I don't really care that much about. I mean, yes, people should be able to, you know, fuck whoever they want and smoke a little pot, whatever, but it's not, it's not that important to me. I'm not going to go occupy a park for that, you know. Yeah. I will do it for $15 an hour minimum wage or something. (laughs) And here's the thing, uh, in terms of like social libertinism, like this is how the libertarian movement gets off. Um, and gets a lot of public support because, again, they still don't criticize the underlying system of corporate capitalism. Right. You know, so you can have uh, guys at the Cato Institute or whatever talk about uh, we need to end the drug war, you know, and stuff like that, and that can all be, you know, and people don't really care about that as long as you still have a society of corporations right. and, and serfs. The market forces and, yeah. are still in place. So. Again, you can advocate for free love. You can advocate for drug use. As long as you're going to bring back child labor and abolish the minimum wage. (laughs) And abolish workplace safety and pollute (laughs) the groundwater and uh, continue the unfettered expansion of uh, police state. state. (laughs) Yeah, and fracking and uh, peeping and flying drones around over American cities. Well, well. Bottom line: Don't dress like a fucking dirty hippie. You know, like, <laughs> like yeah, just put on a collared like, shirt. Yeah, put on a collared shirt. Boots, clean up. Yeah. Don't talk about fucking uh, privilege. Yeah, cut don't your hair. Cut your hair. Get a job. <laughs> you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, and also say that we should overthrow finance capitalism. Right. Uh, violently, if 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 necessary. <laughs> yes. And be armed. That's a good idea. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, if the police are attacking you. You should fight back. (laughs) Money! It's a crime. Share it, don't take a slice of my pie. Alright, um.
Yeah, so one of the problems is uh, when doing a podcast, not everyone wants to have their personal lives broadcasted out to the world. Not everyone is a collection of narcissistic loudmouths like we are. Exactly. So uh, in this upcoming segment, we're going to essentially change the names to protect the innocent, but still be able to talk about our personal lives. So uh, I have somebody in my life. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, their name's Frank. Frank? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, you and Frank... You guys get along pretty well? Really well. I'm surprised. Now, what do you guys do together? I mean, Frank goes shopping. Mm-hmm. Uh, Frank comes over here some most of the time. Yeah. Nice. Sometimes I go to Frank's. Yeah. Okay. And I'll tell you, Frank turns me on big time. Yeah. Do you and Frank touch each other? Me, we, me and Frank engage in heavy petting. Right. Yeah. Nice. Do you like it when Frank grabs your leg, your hands... Yeah, any, anywhere Frank wants to touch. Your feet? Frank is welcome to. Right. Well, hang on a second. I don't care I for the feet getting... too much. Yeah, okay. Why are we talking about Frank? I think, I mean, this is the new low. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're here to talk about Kobe. Right. right. Kobe, do you yeah. like Frank? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Frank right. is a good person. Well, right. do you touch Frank? I touch Frank. <laughs> Any anytime Frank wants it, <laughs> and even sometimes yeah. he, <laughs> Frank's just gotta give me those those doe eyes, yeah, those Bambi eyes, yeah. And I'm I'm all over Frank, th- that person. <laughs> 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 Martin Luther King. He was like spoken. I pa- no, he spoke in a dream. He spoke in he, that black children and white children will hold hands in Mississippi. So, what I'm saying is that I'm you... I'm not going to lie. I could crush that speech two times over. You want, all right? you want to recite I have a dream? Listen. That shit is written down somewhere. I could read it. <laughs> yeah, the new low is marked. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> that'll, be, that'll, be, that'll be a fun one. Oh, yeah. And tell those motherfuckers over at the tea party that I... Us at the new low, we were putting up all that don't tread on me shit in like 2007 before you guys all kicked off with your stupid shit about, um, you know, how Obamacare is like state socialism. Ayn Rand was right. Yeah. So, no, you you have forfeited your right to have those symbols. Us anarchists were taking them back, and uh, you will have to deal with that. In whatever way suits you, because I really don't care what you're doing. You will be dealt with. (laughs) (laughs) This is the thing. I've always been a a huge fan of Ray Lewis's entire career. I've been following it for 17 seasons. He's a franchise player, uh, the face of a team, the hope. For many, uh, all around Baltimore, and Baltimore doesn't have a lot to hope for, and I had a lot to do with that. I also had a lot to do with his success. Um, he, I'm sure he talks about God and how much the Lord powers his intensity and his focus and his ability to really destroy people, but it's really, uh, like I said, I haven't talked to God in a long time. He has very little control here. But I had a hand in uh, his success. Uh, I mean, how could someone be such a destructive presence on the field without some sort of uh, supernatural, extrasensory, infernal, diabolical, satanic sort of guidance? I don't like to do a whole lot. Because more or less, uh, people can be left to their own devices. But it'll be a big day for people in Baltimore. And I look forward to it. I'll be there in person. But you probably won't recognize me. Now, to uh, sort of send this off, 
to wish the city luck and to send off possibly an excellent career in grand tradition. Here is a, a close associate of mine, Adam Peters, reading The Raven by Mr. Edgar Allan Poe. A man who's actually not from Baltimore, but he died here, and I killed him, and that's why he became famous. And he was a necrophiliac. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this, and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember, it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember brought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow, from my books surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden from the angel's name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, to some visitor entreating, entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is, and nothing more. Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness, I implore. But the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you, here I open wide the door, darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before, but the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whisper word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning. Soon again I heard a tapping, somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something in my window lattice. Let me see then, what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with me and of lord or lady perched above my chamber door. Perched upon a bust of polished, just above my chamber door. Perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, By the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn, and shaven thou, I said, Art sure no craven, ghastly grim and an ancient raven, Wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonium shore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear a discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door. Bird or beast upon the sculpture bust above his chamber door was such a name as Nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on the placid bust, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing farther than he muttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, 
other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, Nevermore. Startled at the silence, broken by reply so aptly spoken, Doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store, Caught from some unhappy master whom unmerciful disaster Followed fast and followed faster, till his songs one burden bore, Till the dirges of his hope the melancholy burden bore Of never, never more. But the raven still beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, Straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking, Fancy into fancy, thinking of this ominous bird of yore, With this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore, Meant into croaking, nevermore. This I said engaged, guessing, but no syllable expressing, to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned in my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining, on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er, but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er, she shall press, ah, nevermore. Then, methought, the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, Swung by a seraphim, whose footfalls tingled on the tuft floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent there, By these angels he hath sent thee. Respite, respite in nepenthe, From thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff this kind of nepenthe, And forget this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, Prophet still, if a bird or devil, whether tempter sent or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still if a bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore. Tell the soul with sorrow laden within the distant Aden, it shall clasp a Satan maiden whom the angels name Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked up starting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart, and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, and still is sitting, still is sitting, on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door, and his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight over him streaming throws his shadow on the floor, and my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore.